The vast open sky and the great expanse of earth with its limitless verdant forests, rivers, streams, flora and fauna were the inexhaustible resources of primeval man in the Orient. He was intimately bound in one way or another with all that nature had to offer him. There were those that roamed the forests with their eyes and sensitive ears attuned to the sounds of the beasts, the song of birds, and the soft patter of falling dew. Could our ancestors have remained unmoved by all the wonders of nature? The lively environment would have undoubtedly stirred their hearts and awakened feelings and emotions. These robust men with supple limbs would have broken forth into spontaneous dance and song to express feelings aroused in them by all that they encountered and experienced. The dance may have been the first aesthetic language he invented to communicate his feelings and apprehensions. What better time would there have been for them to express their pleasure and joy than in the cool of the evening, the time they sat for their meal with their companions after a hard day's labor. The dance, which was not restricted to the mere expression of joy, would have in the course of time become another medium to express varied emotions natural to men and women. The tribal dance, while fulfilling a social purpose, in time took shape and form and evolved into a systematic discipline and an art. And finally it has come to be an established form of livelihood, even a profession. What remains today as dancers and the music of Rohuna is all that has been handed down since time immemorial from father to son generation after generation, evolving as it progressed in an unbroken tradition. Be it in dance or music of Ruhuna, what has always been the lively, vibrant pulse beat is the drum. The drum takes many forms and has many names. The runa drum has its own unique character and form. The drum, when used in rituals associated with healing, through exorcism or for appeasing the different yakshas, is called the yakbera, literally the demon's drum. The same, when used in rituals associated with invoking the blessings of the gods, is called the devilbera, the drum of the gods. What could be called the indigenous or Sri Lankan drum is the traditional drum of Ruhuna, the Singhala Bera. The first drums, according to folklore, were made of red sandalwood. Whatever the truth be, the wood of the neem tree or that of the common jack tree came to be used. More common, however, is the drum made of the trunk of the kittle, an indigenous palm, the center of which could easily be scooped out to fashion the hollow body of the drum. The length of the traditional drum is equal to one and a half feet and one span of the hand. The diameter is equal to the length of one span of the hand and three fingers breadth. 
The shape is that of a tubular cylinder. Folklore abounds with many colourful stories about the origin of the runa drum. Underlying all these, the common central concept is that it was created out of the need to express devotion to the gods. Unlike in most other arts, there is no division of labour in making the drum and playing it. Invariably, the craftsman who makes the drum is himself a competent drummer. He is doubly privileged to be both a craftsman who makes the drum and an artist who creates fascinating rhythms. To master the art of drumming, the practitioner has to complete 12 rigorous exercises. The healing rituals of Ruhuna fall into three broad categories based on the time of day the rituals are performed, evening, midnight and at dawn. Each has its own characteristic rhythms and dance steps or movements. Apart from Bali or effigy rituals, all other ritual dances performed in the evenings begin with an invocation to the gods in the form of a chant or a song rendered in a high-pitched tone and dances with slow gentle movements inviting the gods to take their seat on the Malyahana or the flower-decked couch. With the prevalent belief that participation as spectators at these healing rituals enhances the efficacy of such rituals, with the sound of the first beats of the drum, the village folk flock to the venue where the ritual is performed. The bond between the drummer and the dancer has a direct impact on the one who is to be healed. The healing ritual cleanses the mind of the afflicted, of all negative and pessimistic feelings resulting from the affliction. A kind of communion goes on throughout the ritual performance. Most people of the Orient are greatly concerned about the influences of the planets of the solar system as it is thought that they have an influence on the individual. So no sooner a villager is afflicted with an ailment, the close relatives obtain the individual's horoscope and have it read by a competent astrologer. On the advice of the astrologer, an appropriate bali or effigy ritual is performed to counter the malefic influence of the planet responsible for the affliction. The effigy for the Bali ritual is made from the earth taken from an anthill. The colours used in dressing it too are made from the natural materials found in the village. Keteri ankus trisulai Atadara gat me dun iad Gajatunagi min yam gurai Setek rasani e rasntek Warun nug mul neb usai the Bali chant, which is similar to the Pirit chant, may offer useful leads to those seeking the sources of indigenous music. Kushtagad <laughs> 
ಅಷ್ಟ ಉದರದ ಪಿಲ್ಲಿ ಅಂಗಂ ಪಾಂಡು ಕಸಿ ಮುಸವನ ನಷ್ಟವೇ ಮೇ ಸಿಯಲು ಪಿರಿ ಪತ್ ಏರಾಷ್ಟಕ ಬಲಿಯನ The art of carving masks has gone hand in hand with the Ruhuna dances from time immemorial. Masks are used also in Kolam dances. The village craftsmen are extremely clever at carving masks with intricate details. The wood used for carving it is from trees like Rukkattana or Kaduru found in the mangroves of the southern province. Ambalangoda in the south is famous for its concentration of professional craftsmen who carry on an industry and are extremely skillful in all aspects of turning out masks from the selection of wood to the final end product the elaborately carved mask Kolam dance which tradition says goes way back in time to the days of the mythical king Mahasammatha is extremely popular among village audiences for its element of satire directed towards frailties that are bound in human nature and in society the masks are classified according to what they represent common types are animal raksha god and humans among the human category are many representing various characters that one encounters in the village There are also masks to impersonate various characters depicted in Jataka stories. Kolam, the folk dance drama of Runa enacted on the village stage is not merely for evoking mirth and laughter but also to evoke excitement and arouse complex emotions. Variations in the drum beats specific to different movements and different dances intensify the sense of enjoyment and aesthetic pleasure derived from the dance drama. what little remains of these folk art forms that are fast disappearing with the onward march of time is being kept alive by a few families of artists that continue to practice these art forms the maestro edwin gurunance of mirissa and his son are seen here performing an example in the rapidly changing ruhuna one of few such rare examples of families of traditional artists is edwin gurunance who is equally competent in music and dance and song much can be learned about the dancers and music of ruhuna from the likes of edwin gurunance the maestro who sings using the correct modulation of voice the changing beats of the drum as he moves rhythmically while explaining to the audience in expressive words what the particular kolam dance is about Thank you. 
masks representing animals or yakshas are not only used to evoke feelings of fear and excitement, but also for satirizing those pompous individuals who wield power over the ordinary villager. The different characters that are brought on stage are used to generate raucous laughter. The masked characters that portray the village headman or arachi, the police constable, and such other characters one frequently meets in the village are popular with the audience. These characters are burlesqued for the amusement of the audience. What is perhaps amazing is that those persons who are being satirized or ridiculed are themselves in the audience enjoying the performance along with the rest of the villagers. One character that is extremely popular with the audience is Nunchihami, the arrogant old woman. On an evening, the coconut grove by the seaside provides an excellent stage for the maestro, Hingaya Gurunnanse, to share the treasures from his repertoire of traditional dance that has come down for generations. The different exercises, as they are called, are 12 in number and are designed to make the novice's body and limb movements supple and rhythmic. The different aspects of dance associated with healing rituals are taught with extreme care, notwithstanding the contemporary changes of attitudes and beliefs within the village society, for unlike other art forms, these dances deal with beliefs and practices associated with gods and demons and with healing the body and the mind. Pandampalia, literally the torch parade, comprises 12 different movements or parades and are specific to the traditional Ruhuna dance. It is also a spellbinding spectacle. This is a dance similar to what may be seen on the village stage and shows the artistic competence of the dancer. Dancing rhythmically and juggling two or three lighted torches at the same time is quite exciting. 
the raunchy dialogue freely spiced with double entendre titillates the audience. <laughs> These dancers and music and the medium of the healing rituals through which these are expressed and communicated can be truly enjoyed only by those who have grown up in the Rohuna environment and who have empathy with it. Many are the theories as to the origin of the healing rituals and kolam dances of Sri Lanka. Whether these are indigenous or of foreign origin is still not quite clear. However, there is general acceptance that these are specific to Ruhuna and reflect a Sri Lankan identity. One can only theorize as to the origins or identity of these art forms and their survival is assured only till such time as they continue to be part of the life of the people. Nature provides everything needed for the rituals. Every dancer or performer is competent in turning out elaborate sets and other accessories with artistic flair. King Aya, who has to make all the preparations by nightfall for the Nanumura or bathing episode of the Riddhiyaga, meticulously sees to even the smallest of details in preparing the necessary materials. The trunks of banana trees, tender fronds of coconut palms and such other raw materials are obtained from the natural environment. And necessary ornaments like wigs, combs, mirrors, hairpins and other such accessories for the ritual are artistically turned out with these materials, exemplifying the unsophisticated nature and creativity of folk artists. The Sinhalas of the south of Sri Lanka who lead simple and unsophisticated lives hold many beliefs and practice many rites that they consider are part of their heritage. 
To overcome barrenness in women or to provide protection during pregnancy, they perform a special healing ritual, Riddhiyage or Ratayakum. The episode depicting rites associated with bathing or Nanumura parade is complete with all dramatic elements that are possible within a dance of this nature. The Queen Riddhi, who was barren, having planted cotton, preparing the land herself, and having spun yarn and woven a robe, is said to have overcome her barrenness by offering the robe to Deepankara Buddha. In the twelfth episode or parade of the Nanumura ritual dance is depicted the queen bathing and cleansing herself and dressing in fresh clothes and putting on ornaments and other adornments. The songs that accompany the action reflect the vitality of folk literature and lyricism. The role of the Riddhi Queen is played by a male and the characterization is so expressive that it excites and enthralls the audience. As in all other ritual healings, the dialogue is part of the device with which the dancer breaks the monotony. The dialogue is usually improvised and raunchy and double entendre is very common and adds to the enjoyment of the rustics. But the dancers take care to render the songs or chants without improvisation or embellishment of their own. century many are the fishermen who continue with their traditional fishing techniques. Apart from the majority who go to sea in boats, there are still some who fish with hook and line in shallow seas. These and others like those who fish standing up on poles who are only to be found in the south of Sri Lanka face endless difficulties and untold privations. Apart from the difficulties and hazards they face, the turbulent seas during the periodic monsoons adversely affect their fishing activities and their livelihood. During such times, they are totally helpless. They resort to a ritual practice called the Garayakkuma, or ritual of the Garayaka. The belief being that it will lead to an increase in the fish stocks and thus their catch. The all-night ritual is held on the shore or on a boat in the shallow sea. 
The Garayak ritual is specific to the south of Sri Lanka. It has its own identity as a dance form. The Garayak mask hung on the outer front wall of some rural houses to be seen by passers-by, it is said, is done with the belief that the mask has the power to ward off any malefic effects and afflictions caused by evil eye or envious words. The Garayak ritual is performed with the same purpose in mind. This particular mask is one of the most fascinating according to ones who are knowledgeable about masks. The folk music of Rahuna has no affinity with the scale of notes of the classical music system. The narrow scale of notes are learned by ear by the younger generation who learn from their elders by listening to the renderings of the elders and through imitative repetition. Although there is no system of music that could be said to be typical of Rahuna, there are certain identifiable ways of vocalization and modulation that go along with the rhythms of the yakbera, the runa drum. The modulation of the voice through variations of pitch to keep up with the rhythms played on the drum typifies runa singing. The style of this musical communication may reveal some of the basic principles underlying runa folk music. Perhaps the characteristic feature of Rahuna folk music is that the ritual healing dances and chants, which provide the medium of musical expression, also provide the artist with space and opportunities for improvisation to suit particular situations. <laughs> Such expressive variations and improvisations go toward evoking a gamut of emotions that deepen the enjoyment among the audience. What is unique is, whatever the style of singing or chanting, the only musical accompaniment is the drum. This is unique to traditional Rahuna music and that makes it different from all other traditions. Dhatasanya, or the parade of 18 demons, are ritual healing dances, unique to Rahuna. The necessary sets and all accessories are made of materials that can be found in the natural environment. The sets, the ornaments, altars and all other creations necessary for the rituals are elements of a composite artistic creation and they blend in an extremely pleasing way to create the necessary effect and atmosphere. The Runa dancers have an inborn competence in all aspects of these art forms. Thank <laughs> you. 
In all ritual healing dances except Bali or effigy ritual, the Dahata Sanya also begins with the Malyan invocation addressed to the spirits or demons to be present. The ritual consists of colorful parades or paliyas of 18 demons which goes on throughout the night. Dancers, to alleviate the monotony, break into dialogues full of double entendre, which is part of the folk idiom. Only one who is conversant with the folk beliefs and the folk idiom may fully appreciate this kind of dialogue. <laughs> Dancers accompanied with gentle movements and simple lilting renderings of songs interspersed with fear evoking vigorous dances with lyrics appropriate to the moods and emotions aroused and drum meets that match all that add up to make the Dhata Sanya an enthralling spectacle. The Sunni demons come before the afflicted one for whom the ritual is performed and introduces himself and blesses the patient and then leaves. While they come and go, the dancers dressed in princely attire come on stage adding color to the spectacle with their Kumara Palia or the Parade of the Princes. The Sanya Kuma, it is said, is for the purpose of warding off the ill effects and malefic afflictions caused by evil spirits. Bodily illness, it is believed, is due to the imbalance of the three humors and the fear of death. The torch parade, or the parade of lamps, and other different paliyas, which are twelve in number, are a preliminary to the Dahata Sanya. All these relate closely to each other and the Daha Atapalia. So are the songs and chants that go along with the dances, all of which keep the audience spellbound. with the 
departure or chasing away of the demons summoned, and the dousing of the fire, and invocations to the gods offering thanks. It is not possible to present or discuss the various aspects like the cultural or social significance or even the origin and development of these dances and music and the beliefs underlying these art forms in a program of this nature. This is only a brief glimpse or an introduction to Ruhuna dance and music and some of the beliefs underlying these art forms. We are confident that the curiosity aroused should be sufficiently compelling to explore deeper into the dances and music of Ruhuna. An art form from way back in the days of the mythical king Mahasammatha cannot be expected to be unfolded within a mere hour or two.